Hi everybody, welcome to day three of our shutdown. I wanted to check in with everybody uh, and say hi. Uh, letting parents know uh, there's a little bit of information I have in the video uh, and then I'll do the read aloud. For students I've got the read aloud coming up and some more information. Uh, and just want to check in and say hi. Um, next week I'll start calling everybody, try to get a hold of you guys and touch base with you. Um, and uh, I want to keep touching base with you. I've talked to a lot of parents already. Please keep sending me messages if you have any questions at all. Uh, if you'd rather, you can call me. Like I said, my school, you can call my school extension. Uh, and we can go from there. So do all of those great things or email. That's great too. So keep in touch. I want to keep in touch with you guys. It's been great uh, talking back with, uh, talking back and forth with some of the students and parents already. So keep sending me messages if you have any questions. I uh, keep checking Dojo for any other updates, um, but I've got a few things to go over. For starters, don't forget that there's free breakfast and lunch every weekday um, at the school. Uh, so it is 11 to 1, like today, uh, you can go pick up, uh, you'll get your lunch for today and then they give you tomorrow's breakfast. It's for all students 18 and younger so feel free to get those um, a good opportunity uh, to make your grocery stretch a little longer um, give those kids a nutritious meal it's free it's available just got to stop by the high school 11 to 1 there's cones out it's super simple and it's just grab and go don't even have to get out of your car uh, yesterday mr richie and mr narges were passing out uh, so you'll get a chance to see some, some friendly faces um, and get out of the house a little bit. So take the take the opportunity to go pick those up, uh, and it's for any of the students that are they're 18 or younger. So um, if you're taking care of a, a boatload of kids, it's a nice, quick, easy way to make your life easier. Uh, so feel free to take that advantage uh, and take that opportunity. Here are some thoughts just for today. Uh, feel free. To, we're going to finish Hatchet today, so you can take an AR test. Uh, your test number is going to be uh, 367. The Hatchets were 7 points, so if you haven't taken a test on Hatchet already, we're going to finish this guy today uh, right after this video, so feel free to take a Socrative test on that and get your 7 AR points. So take an AR test today. I did post a math kahoot yesterday on angles. Some people already did. Awesome. If you haven't, it's a good review. Uh, it's one that we did already in class. Parents are more than ha our parents and siblings are welcome to play along as well and, and try that out and kind of have a little challenge back and forth. So feel free to do that as well. But certainly kids could take that math kahoot um, and just log on the code that's that's on the math part. You have to go to the math part of class dojo. So get out of Mr. S's homeroom and go into math, but I posted it in there. Uh, I'm also going to post uh, in Socrative uh, for uh, response to um, to a hatchet. So I'm going to post a little question in there, log on to, to, to there uh, to get that. The code for Socrative, hopefully you remember, is 292450 uh, is my Socrative, um, Socrative login. So log in to Socrative today and, and give me a response to the question I have for, about Hatchet. That would be a good thing to do. Um, don't forget to do your PE stretches. It's kind of a crummy day. I'm not going to sign anything outside, but it would be a good idea to get some stretches in or do something or do your dots like I asked yesterday. Those would be a good thing uh, to do as well. Uh, it's kind of a crummy day, so I don't know if you want to do anything outside, but um, it'd be a good thing to get something in. And then, since it's Friday, can I do something fun? I thought it'd be a good idea to create something. Start with something that's not there and make it. That could be something with Legos. You guys do have Keynote. You could do something cool using Instant Alpha or something along those lines um, or cut something out of paper. I don't know. Start with something that's not there and make it. I think it'd be really cool, and I would love to see some pictures of that. So... Take a picture of something that you guys made today and send it to me. I just want to see what you guys are up to. So I would love to see, uh, post it in Dojo. If you made something today, that'd be awesome. Send it to me. I think it'd be really cool. Um, so please feel free, make something today and send it. I want to see what's going on. 
Uh, and otherwise, I'll keep in touch too. Um, but keep those message or questions coming to me. I love answering. I love hearing from you guys. So keep those coming. Without any further ado, we're going to finish Hatchet. We're almost done. Um, and we're on our last chapter. So chapter 19 of Hatchet. If you remember, I left off yesterday. He had worked really hard. And he finally, finally, finally was able to get that survival pack out of the plane. He got it on shore. Um, and uh, that's where I'm going to pick up. Treasure. Unbelievable riches. He could not believe the contents of the survival pack. I asked you guys yesterday if you could think of what might be in there so you can check your answers to see if he has the same things that you might have thought of. The night before, he was so numb with exhaustion that he couldn't do anything but sleep. All day in the water had tired him out so much that in the end, he had fallen asleep sitting against the shelter wall, oblivious to the mosquitoes, to the night, to, it, to anything. But in the false gray dawn, he had awakened and instantly began to dig through the pack to find wonderful things. There was a sleeping bag, which he hung to dry over his shelter roof on the outside, and a foam sleeping pad, an aluminum cook set with four little pots and two frying pans. It actually even had a fork and a knife and a spoon, a waterproof container with matches and two small butane lighters, a sheath knife with a compass in the handle, as if a compass would help him, he thought, smiling, a first aid kit with bandages and a tube of antiseptic paste and a small scissors, a cap that said Cessna across the front in large letters. Why a cap, he wondered. It was adjustable, and he put it on immediately. A fishing kit with four coils of line and a dozen small lures and hooks and sinkers. Incredible wealth. It was like all the holidays in the world, all the birthdays there were. He sat in the sun by the doorway where it had dropped in the night before and pulled out the presents as he thought of them. Out one at a time to examine them, turn them in the light, touch them, feel them in his hands and eyes. Something at first puzzled him. He pulled out what seemed to be a broken-off, bulky stock of a rifle, and he was going to put it aside, thinking it might be for something else in the pack, but then he shook it and it rattled. After working at it for a moment, he found the butt of the stock came off, and inside there was a barrel and a magazine and an action assembly with a clip full of 50 shells. It was a twenty-two survival rifle. He had seen one once in a sporting goods store where he went for bike parts, and the barrel screwed into the stock. He had never owned a rifle, never fired one, but he had seen them on television. Of course, after a few moments of figuring out how to put it together, screwing the action off the stock and how to load it and put the clip full of bullets into the action, it was a strange feeling holding the rifle. It somehow removed him from everything around him. Without the rifle, he had fit, fit in to be a part of it all, to understand it, to use it. The woods, all of it. With the rifle, suddenly he didn't know how. Did not have to be afraid or understand. He didn't have to clo get close to a fool bird to kill it. Didn't have to know how to, he'd have to stand, how he'd look at it and move off to the side. The rifle changed him the minute he picked it up, and he wasn't sure he liked the change very much. He set it off to the side, leaning it carefully against the wall. He could deal with that feeling later. The fire was out, and he used the butane lighter and a piece of birch bark and two small twigs to get another one started, marveling at how easy it was, but feeling again that the lighter somehow removed him from where he was. What he had had to know. With a flame ready, he didn't know how to make the, he didn't have to know how to make a spark nest or how to feed the new flames to make them grow. As with the rifle, he wasn't sure he liked the change. Up and down, he thought, the pack was wonderful, but it gave him up and down feelings. With the fire going and sending up black smoke and a steady roar and pitch smelling from the pitch smelling chunk, 
he put on. He turned once more to the pack, rummaging through the food packets. He hadn't brought them out yet because he wanted to save them until last, glory in them. He came up with a small electronic device completely encased in plastic bag. At first he thought it was a radio or a cassette player and he had a surge of hope because he was missing music, missed sounds, missed hearing another voice. But he opened up the plastic and took the thing out and turned it on, turned it over and you could see it wasn't a receiver at all. There was a coil wire held together on the side by tape and it sprung into a three foot long antenna when he took it off the tape. No speaker, no lights, just a small switch at the top and bottom. He finally found in small print, emergency transmitter. That was it. He turned the switch back and forth a few times, but nothing happened. He couldn't even hear static. So as at the rifle, he set it against the wall and went back to the bag. It was probably ruined in the crash, he thought. Two bars of soap. He had bathed regularly in the lake, but not with soap, and he thought how wonderful it would be to wash his hair, thick with grime and smoke and dirt, frizzled, frizzed by the wind and sun, matted with the fish and fool bird grease. His hair had grown and stuck and tangled and grown until it was a clumped mess on his head. He could use the scissors from the first aid kit to cut it off and then wash it with soap. And then, finally, the food. It was all freeze-dried, and in such quantity that he had thought, this, with this I could live forever. Package after package he took out. Beef dinner with potatoes, cheese, and noodle dinners. Chicken dinners, egg and potato breakfasts, fruit mixes, drink mixes, dessert mixes. More dinners and breakfasts than he could count easily. Dozens and dozens of them, all packed in waterproof bags, all in perfect shape. And when he had them all out and laid them against the wall in stacks, he could stand, stand, he couldn't stand it, and he went through them again. If I'm careful, he thought, they'll last as long as, as long as I need them to last, if I'm careful. No, not yet. I won't be careful just yet. First, I'm going to have a feast. Right here and now, I'm going to cook up a feast and eat until I drop. Then I'll be careful. And he went into the food packets once more and selected what he wanted for his feast. A four-person beef and potato dinner with orange drink for an appetizer and something called peach whip for dessert. Just add water, it said on the package, and cook for an hour, half hour or so until everything is normal sized and done. Brian went to the lake and got water in one of the aluminum pots and brought it back to the fire. Just that amazed him, being able to carry water to the fire in a pot. Such a simple act that he hadn't been able to do for almost two months. He guessed at the amount and put the beef dinner and the peach dessert on to boil. And then he went back to the lake and brought water up for the mix with the orange drink. It was sweet and tangy, almost too sweet, but so good that he didn't drink it fast. He held it in his mouth and let the taste go over his tongue, tickling on the side, sloshing back and forth with them. Swallow, then another. That, he thought, that is just fine, just fine. He got more lake water and mixed another one and drank it fast, then a third one. He sat near the fire, but looking out across the lake, thinking how rich the smell was coming from the cooking beef dinners. There was garlic in it and some other spices and smells that came to him and made him think of home, his mother cooking, the rich smells of the kitchen. In that precise instant, with his mind full of home and the smell from the food filling him, the plane appeared. He had only a moment of warning. There was a tiny drone, but as with before, it didn't register suddenly. Roaring over his head, low and back to the ridge, a bush plane with floats fairly exploded into, into life. It passed directly over him, very low, tipping a wing sharply over the tail of the crashed plane in the lake. Cut power, gliding down to the long part of the lake, then turned and glided back, touching the water gently once, twice, and settling with the spray to taxi to a stop, with its floats gently bumping the beach in front of Brian's shelter. He had not moved. It all happened so fast that he hadn't moved. He sat up with a pot of orange drink still in his hand, staring at the plane, not quite understanding it yet. 
not quite knowing yet that it was over. The pilot cut the engine, opened the door, got out, balanced, and stepped forward on the float to hop to the sand without getting his feet wet. He was wearing sunglasses and took them off to stare at Brian. I heard your emergency transmitter. Then I saw the plane and I came over. He trailed off, cocked his head, studying Brian. Wow, you're him, aren't you? You're that kid. They quit looking a month or, no, almost two months ago. You're him, aren't you? You're that kid. Brian was standing now, but silent, still holding his drink. His tongue seemed to be stuck to the roof of his mouth and his throat. Didn't work quite right. He looked at the pilot, at the plane, down at himself, dirty and ragged, burned and lean and tough, and he coughed to clear his throat. What do you guys think he's going to say? He hasn't spoken to another person in two months. He hasn't spoken to another person. And now he's got somebody. What do you think he's going to say? My name is Brian Robeson, he said. Then he saw that his stew meat was done and the peach whip was almost done and he waved to it with his hand. Would you like something to eat? And that's really the end of the story. Uh, there's an epilogue. Epi means outside of, log means to write. So this is kind of the writing outside of it. So I'll read these couple pages too. So this is the epilogue. The pilot who landed so suddenly on the lake was a fur buyer ma mapping Cree trapping camps for future buying runs. Drawn by Brian when he unwittingly turned on the emergency transmitter and left it going. The Cree moved into camps for the fall and winter to trap for the buyers flying in from camp to camp on a regular route. When the pilot rescued Brian, he had been alone on the L-shaped lake for 54 days. During that time, he had lost 17% of his body weight. He later gained back 6%, but virtually no body fat. His body had consumed all the extra weight, and he would remain lean and wiry for several years. Many of the changes would prove to be permanent. Brian had gained immense, immensely in his ability to observe what was happening and react to it. That would last him all his life. He had become more thoughtful as well, and from that time on he would think slowly about something before speaking. Food, all food, even food he did not like, never lost its wonder for him. For years after his rescue, he would find himself stopping in grocery stores and stare at the aisles of food, marveling at the quality and the variety. There were so many questions in his mind that he, what he had seen and known he worked at research when he got back, identifying the game and the berries. Gut cherries were termed choke cherries. They made good jelly. The nut bushes where the fool birds hid were hazelnut brush bushes. There were two kinds of rabbits were snowshoes and cottontails. The fool birds were ruffled grouse, also called fool hens by the trappers for their stupidity. The small food fish were bluegills, sunfish, and perch. The turtle eggs were laid by a snapping turtle, as he had thought. The wolves were timber wolves, which were not known to attack or bother people. The moose was a moose. There were also the dreams. He had many dreams about the lake after he was rescued. The Canadian government sent a team to recover the body of the pilot, and they took reporters who naturally took pictures and film of the whole campsite, the shelter, all of it. For a brief time, the press made much of Brian and was interviewed for several networks, but the fewer died down within a few months. A writer showed up who wanted to do a book of the complete adventure, as he called it, but it turned out to be a dreamer, and all that came was nothing but talk. Still, Brian was given copies of the pictures and tape and looked at them and seemed to trigger the dreams. They were not nightmares. None of them were frightening, but he would awaken at times with, with them, just awake and sit up still thinking of the lake, the forest, the fire at night, the night birds singing, the fish jumping. Still in the dark, alone to think of them, it was not bad, and it would not never be bad for him. Predictions are, for the most part, ineffective. But it might be interesting to note that Brian, if he had not been rescued when he was, he would have been forced to go into a hard fall, perhaps winter. It would have been very rough on him. When the lake froze over, he would have lost the fish, and when the snow got deep, he would have trouble moving at all. Game becomes seemingly plentiful in the fall. It's easier to see when the leaves are off the brush. 
but in winter it gets scarce and sometimes simply non-existent as predators fox lynx wolves owls weasels fisher martin northern coyote sweep through the areas and wipe things out it was amazing it was amazing what a single owl can do with a local population of ruffled grouse and rabbits in just a few months. After the initial surprise and happiness from his parents of being alive, for a week it looked like they might actually get back together. Things rapidly went back to normal. His father returned to the northern oil fields, where Brian eventually visited him, and his mother stayed in the city, worked her at a career in real estate, and continued to see the man in the station wagon. Brian tried several times to tell his father, came really close once at doing it, but in the end never said a word about the man or what he knew, the secret. And that is the end of Hatchet. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I thought it was a good book, um, one of my favorites. I know it's Mr. Ritchie's favorite too, uh, so I hope you guys enjoyed it. So Hatchet, hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, take a look back through the beginning of the video. There's a few recommend, recommendations to, to look at. Uh, I hope you guys have a really good day today and a really good weekend. Um, and I'll post another video back on Monday. So uh, I hope you guys are having a good day, having a good time. I'll touch base. Feel free, again, send me a message. I want you guys to create something today. It would be awesome if you send me a picture of it on Dojo. I want to see it. If you get a chance, log in to Socrative. That would be cool. Um, and take a look at some of those cahoots that are posted. So uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to work ahead and do some of the other stuff if that's something you're ready to do. If not, I get it. So uh, touch base with me. I'd love to hear from you guys. All right. Have a good weekend.